breaking news in America's coal mining country. We now know the coal mine that exploded Monday has a history of safety violations. A blistering report out tonight on the West Virginia coal mine. A report out tonight on the West Virginia coal mine. On April 5th, the United States suffered the worst mine disaster in more than a generation. Nearly everyone reporting the Upper Big Branch tragedy said that a coal bed methane buildup ignited and created a coal dust explosion where 29 miners lost their lives. Their conclusion? A poor safety record and failures by management led to the accident. The safety record at the Massey Upper Big Branch mine was troubling. Owners responsible for conditions in the Upper Big Branch mine should be held accountable for decisions they made and preventive measures they failed to take. As CEO of Massey Energy, Don Blankenship was responsible for operation of the mine, as well as for the safety of its workers. He believes the evidence points to a truth that has been buried. It's the right thing to uh, tell the truth, get the truth out there, and have it be the uh, foundation for the path forward. So this documentary uh, is in a sense, a request that the industry, the unions, the, uh, the associations, the government uh, make an effort to uh, truly identify what happened at UBB, which has not been done, uh, by the government at least, and to uh, put in place procedures and technologies and uh, changes and regulations that prevent it from happening again. 7 a.m. Monday, April 5th, 2010. According to official reports, two crews are underground inside the Upper Big Branch mine. At 2.30 p.m., five safe readings of 0% methane and nearly 21% oxygen are reported, but rock dusting of the conveyor belts is requested. Ten minutes later, the same readings are reported, and one of the crews begin their man-trip ride out of the mine. Around 3 o'clock, a fire ignites, and the crew manually cuts power to the long wall shearer. Between 3.01 and 3.02 p.m., an explosion erupts through the mine, lasting for several minutes. Emergency crews and rescue teams race to the scene and would later recover the bodies of 29 dedicated miners, as the West Virginia Office of Miners Health Safety and Training and the Federal Mine Safety and Health Administration search for clues to find out what happened. The McAteer Report, conducted by David McAteer, concluded the company's ventilation system did not adequately ventilate the mine. As a result, explosive gases were allowed to build up. The company failed to meet federal and state safe principal standards for the application of rock dust. While the evidence the government presented may point to these conclusions, the forensic evidence points to another explanation. If you just look at the burned gases from either a natural gas or coal bed methane, it would be very difficult to tell that it was the difference between those two. Basically, uh, the violations that were written at UBB had nothing to do with the explosion except that they did force uh, the mine to make ventilation changes that reduced the air flow on the long wall probably 60%. Politics still dominates the picture, unfortunately. Forensic evidence proves MSHA got it wrong, and the media ignored all other explanations. To think that that condition after the explosion was actually the condition that existed before the explosion is an insult to the miners. Natural gas uh, is a gas. It's, it's, uh, it's soluble in the air. It's, it's volatile, and it mixes in the air. There's a procedure where you can call directly up to MSHA if you think there's an emergency situation. They have the authority to shut down the mine if they think it's a very dangerous situation. So now the question must be asked, is the energy from coal worth it? The industry is neither small nor unimportant. Can politics make coal mining safer? MSHA is dictating changes without adequate knowledge. It's pretty common for us to see regulations put in place that are not actually based on good science or engineering principles. And is it likely that miners would overlook common safety problems? 
the minute he got into that black section. He'd turn around, go back, and he'd say, get that goddamn section rock dusted. I'm not going to work in a section that is not rock dusted. The Upper Big Branch explosion killed 29 brave miners in April of 2010. The investigative reports blame a money-hungry Massey Energy for putting profits in front of safety. But the company's former CEO, Don Blankenship, believes that by failing to properly evaluate the forensic evidence and make necessary safety changes, this disaster could be repeated. Both sides can agree that while it is hazardous, mining is important. The nation mines 85 commodities everything from gravel and sand to gold and copper, diamonds, minerals, all going into everyday life without notice. Electricity demand and the use of electricity is directly correlated to the quality of life. And so it's not just coal communities that benefit from coal production, it's anyone that uses electricity in the United States. Coal, America's industrial backbone, sustained and propelled this great nation through the Industrial Revolution and carried the weight of technology into this century. This abundant fossil fuel provides reliable and affordable energy for all, creating jobs for depressed communities and bringing vitality to the American dream. We know about all the wars that we fought for independence. We know from our, you know, the, the, the stranglehold the British had on us and basically how we overcame all of that and then our own civil war that we had. Through all of this, the thing that made this country was the abundant supply of the natural resource of, uh, of coal. Recently, coal has taken a backseat to newer forms of energy, such as renewable energy. Electricity is critical to our lifestyle. And people talk about bringing on wind and solar. Well, those are relying on natural resources. But in reality, those provide such a small percentage of our electrical needs in this country we still rely heavily on power generation. So there is a general negative perception amongst younger generations that mining is, we don't need mining, it's dirty, and, and uh, you know, it's not critical to our lifestyle. This type of forward thinking has discounted the raw truth that our lifestyle is supported by mined material such as coal. There's an old saying, you either farm it or you mine it. You can't fill 30 to 35 percent of the uh, of the resources that we're using to make energy with when you don't have anything to replace it with, and all you're going to do is drive the price so unbelievably high. Everything in society, your cell phone, medicines, car, yes, the military protecting our shores, on top of those computer gadgets we all love. They're all based on pulling raw materials from the ground and delivering them to producers. Coal mine operators have kept costs and prices low by raising their productivity. This increase in productivity has had a major positive impact on the United States economy. Statistics show about 2.1 million Americans earn their living directly and indirectly from mining. This generates $51 billion in taxes from the mining industry, and the total economic contribution to the country is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. These numbers show that the mining industry is neither small nor unimportant. Coal mining began in the 1740s in Virginia. Today, underground coal is mined by two methods. There's room and pillar mining, that uh, you can think of as streets and street, developing a set, set of streets and avenues that allow us access to, to the mine. And uh, it's done by continuous miners driving openings that are generally 20 feet wide and as high as the, as the seam is thick. The upper big branch mine was a different kind, known as a long wall mine. Uh, we mine blocks out that are typically 1,000 to 1,500 feet wide and typically two miles long. We put a giant cheese slicer, essentially, at one end of it with, that has a row of supports above it. And this cheese slicer just comes back and forth and back and forth, and, and the coal is literally mined continuously. 
As coal mining technology has progressed, so too has technology to protect those who work underground. Mining's been going on in the United States for a couple hundred years. Some of the early practices we don't condone today. Ear protection wasn't a common practice in a lot of the mining operations, so respiration, dust control was not a big issue, so you had a lot of black lung disease. All of those things we've learned more about and have taken measures to minimize the impact of you know, miners. The dust control is a huge part of our mining operations anymore. Mining ventilation is a constant concern in mining safety. One of the most important tasks for mining engineers is to get enough fresh air into the mine for the machines to operate properly, and most importantly, for the miners who require a safe environment in which to work. The ventilation system is designed in such a way that you can dilute and render harmless any methane that's emitted from the coal seam as you mine it. In addition to ventilation, other technology helps protect miners. If methane levels get too high, methane detectors mounted on mining machines will automatically shut these machines down until the air is cleaned by the mine's ventilation system. Well, here's the thing, on some machineries today, you know, they have sensors on them. Everything is done to minimize the accident incident rate and actually send that miner home safely at the end of the day. Statistically, mining is among the safest industries in the United States. It's safer than retail, safer than many forms of manufacturing, and safer than many government jobs. Mining differentiates from these industries in that when accidents of high severity happen, there tend to be worse outcomes with more severe injuries and even fatalities. 29 miners lost their lives and two were injured in the explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine in April 2010. According to the United States Department of Labor's Mine Safety and Health Administration, known as MSHA, the tragedy was caused by a massive coal dust explosion that was secondary to a methane gas ignition. MSHA claims that this was because of a pattern of safety violations at the mine. The culture of the normalization of deviance. The company had gotten away with so many, a gradual approach over a number of years, gotten away with so many infractions of standard safety practices that it became normal. Although Upper Big Branch was a non-union mine and the miners at Upper Big Branch twice voted not to unionize, the United Mine Workers of America, or UMWA, weighed in on the disaster. And I think it's something that I should point out to you and we call this pretty much uh, industrial homicide. Union President Cecil Roberts reads further from the UMWA report. The path of the explosion, aided by poor ventilation, ineffective water sprays, excessive, excessive accumulations of float coal dust, and inadequate rock dusting sealed these miners' fate. This is the account reported by the government, the UMWA, and the media. However, many independent experts tell a different story, one that is based on forensic evidence. The government's case against Massey Energy seemed flawless, but what scientific evidence disproves a coal dust explosion? It inerts it. It's like spraying water on a fire. Yeah, the fact that you have such a high amount of uh, methane and ethane seems to suggest that it's some other gas. Has politics made mining more dangerous? At UBB, the uh, ventilation plan, which Joe Main, the head of Elmshire, testified in front of Congress was not their plan, was the only plan we could get them to approve. The Upper Big Branch explosion claimed the lives of 29 miners. MSHA believes that the evidence points to three major failings by Massey, an unsafe level of coal dust in the mine, inadequate rock dusting, and poor ventilation. But these conclusions rest on only a portion of the evidence, disregarding key details. MSHA claims that high levels of methane from the coal bed served as the original fuel for the explosion, which then caused a secondary coal dust explosion. But the coal bed is not the only possible source of methane. 
Emsha's own experts found more than just methane in their readings at the Bandytown fan, the primary exhaust port where the entire ventilation system of Upper Big Branch exited the mine. Coal bed methane is released during the normal process of mining coal, but forensic evidence points to another form of gas leaking into Upper Big Branch, and it too is highly combustible. Yeah, they're both the same phenomena. Small amount of higher hydrocarbons still gives you an explosion. But the characteristic signal of a deep reservoir is higher concentrations of the heavier hydrocarbons. The coal seam by itself, when you do analysis of the methane emitted from the coal seam, you get mostly almost completely methane, pure methane. On the other hand, a reservoir of natural gas deep below the coal seam will give, give you typically a signature with higher much higher concentrations. Forensic evidence indicates that natural gas inundated the mine through a crack that was found in the mine's floor. It's a very rare uh, occurrence, but apparently there must be a high pressure reservoir somewhere near there where there's actually an inflow, a, a massive inflow of gas from a nearby, uh, apparently, gas reservoir. Although there were cracks in the floor at Upper Big Branch, and despite Massey's insistence that they not be disturbed until they could be fully evaluated, M shall refuse these cracks to be fully evaluated. It is likely that natural gas inundated the mine through these cracks. If there's a failure of the strata, the natural, natural gas reservoir at a high pressure, once the strata failed, would eject in, in an enormous uh, amount. There would be, be a huge disturbance. It would hiss. Not only would it make noise, but it'd kick up lots of rocks from the crack through which it's flowing. Amsha states that Massey was insufficiently rock dusting the mine. Rock dusting is the mandatory spraying of mine surfaces with pulverized rock to help prevent coal dust combustion. Normally, coal dust is explosive. So the regulations require that be inerted with rock dust to about 80%. It's usually limestone, pulverized limestone, fine enough size so that it cools the flame and prevents propagation. It's like spraying water on a fire. The government's investigators say that Massey had a poor safety record and put profits before safety. However, there are some questions about some of those investigators. According to a report, a search warrant was executed on McAteer's law office in February 2012 in connection with a fraud investigation being conducted by NASA and the Department of Labor's Office of Racketeering and Fraud. He was also arrested on November 5, 1999 for DUI and leaving the scene. He pled no contest 18 months later to a charge of reckless driving. There are also questions regarding the credentials of MCHA chief Joe Main. Furthermore, in 2001, an explosion at Jim Walter Resources No. 5 mine claimed the lives of 13 miners. MSHA's explosion expert blamed inadequate rock dusting as a contributing factor. Independent explosion expert Martin Hertzberg also investigated Jim Walter No. 5 and came up with different conclusions. In the Jim Walters No. 5 mine, it was quite obvious. You went in and at the entry of the mine, everything was nice and white, it was completely rock dusted. The minute you got into the area where there had been an explosion, everything was jet black. MSHA based many of its conclusions about conditions in the mine prior to the explosion by looking at the conditions after the explosion. Hertzberg states that you cannot gauge rock dusting by looking at an explosion's after effects. The explosion is such enormous disturbance in the mine. The pressures are so high, dust gets kicked around, chunks of coal get banged into, into equipment and pulverized. You cannot tell that. And it's an insult to miners to imply that they would go work in a section that looked as black as that. The same MSHA explosion expert that pointed to improper rock dusting at Jim Walter was called to investigate Upper Big Branch, where he also blamed inadequate rock dusting. 
Amshan politicians say that the miners were working in unsafe conditions because they were being intimidated. This argument is flawed. The minute he got into that black section, red flags would go up. He'd turn around, go back, and he'd say, get that goddamn section rock dusted. I'm not gonna work in a section that is not rock dusted. That's enough evidence to tell you that you cannot determine conditions that existed before an explosion by conditions that exist after the explosion. Amsha claims that Massey's ventilation plan was subpar, but Blankenship says that it was, in fact, Amsha's plan, and that the mine exploded just days after their requirements were fully enacted. At UBB, the uh, ventilation plan, which Joe Main, the head of Elmshire, testified in front of Congress was not their plan, was the only plan we could get them to approve. So they're able to say they don't write ventilation plans, but the truth of the matter is they don't approve any ventilation plan that they don't favor. The U.S. Court of Appeals agreed with Elmshire that the agency could force a coal mine to accept the government's ventilation plan, despite the company's knowledge of their own mine and engineering expertise. What you find is that, that the person will never put anything in writing other than the fact that, that he's rejected the plan, but then he will orally tell the people what, what it is that they have to put in the plan. So they end up putting a plan in that's not really their plan, it's his plan, but then, then, then he turns around and says, well, it's your plan, you have to live with it now. Because of these practices, Blankenship claims that MSHA forced Upper Big Branch to downgrade their highly effective ventilation system. And the law only requires 30,000 CFM of air. We had 120,000 when we were operating the mine the way we wanted to operate it. When we got through making the changes that the government wanted to make, we were around 50,000. So even though we were complying with the law, we didn't have nearly the amount of air that we believed was proper. So when the government comes in and tells you that it's a better ventilation plan to take 60% of the air off the face, then you know that they are not looking at it mathematically or scientifically. I think it's common sense that uh, if you have a coal mine that's performed well for 15 years and uh, not had uh, issues with its ventilation that you need to be careful about making a change in it. And when you come from Washington, D.C. or some government office and start dictating to coal mines that they are going to make changes in the ventilation plan, uh, you need to have done your homework. You need to have uh, done a computer simulation of that ventilation plan change and you need to have consulted with uh, other individuals that are knowledgeable in that field. When you uh, simply go in and use your power to uh, force companies to do things that they have not done in the past, it's not, uh, not reasonable. Current ventilation standards are only designed to protect against slow methane released from the coal bed and not from a high velocity gas leak because if you had a rapid release of natural gas, even ventilators uh, would, would have a hard time coping with that, that release. If it was massive, then, then yeah, that would be a problem. We now see that reporters, unions, and the government ignored the evidence that supports a theory that makes sense, a theory that is backed by MSHA's own findings. And the ventilation system is designed in such a way that you can dilute and render harmless any methane that's emitted from the coal seam as you mine it. An inundation is a special situation in which a large reservoir of methane breaks through into the, into the mine. We typically have methane gases associated with coal mining. We do have incidents that are geologic anomalies, as we call them, that we didn't anticipate. Going forward in the mining operation, you may end up with a, a fault or a, a fracture system that is full of gas, more than the typical rock would have. The deeper you go, the higher the pressure. And the deeper the reservoir, the higher the pressure and the faster the flow. Inundation is evidenced by the types of gas that are present when it occurs. Coal bed gas and the coal seams at Upper Big Branch are virtually pure methane. However, natural gas contains ethane, and the government found enough ethane at the ventilation exhaust 
to confirm a natural gas inundation using MSHA's own Bandy Town fan data, which recorded high levels of ethane, independent experts conclude the presence of natural gas rather than coal seam gas. The fact that you have such a high amount of uh, methane and ethane seems to suggest that it's some other gas. This is more like a natural gas. It looks like natural gas. From what you've given me, it seems reasonable that the natural gas could be the cause of this. So, Despite our best efforts and our geology and our information that we drill and try and understand to avoid those accidents, but occasionally it happens. And it's unpredictable, unanticipated, and it's simply an unfortunate accident when it happens. But while official reports accused Upper Big Branch management of creating a culture of putting profits over safety, then why did Blankenship create some of the best safety innovations in the industry? At Massey, I probably was personally responsible for dozens of safety enhancements on equipment. Is MSHA blocking the use of safety innovations? Experts say that government regulatory agencies should become more proactive in supporting new ideas and innovations. This would certainly be welcomed by the industry. Instead, these agencies often see how many dollars they can rack up in citations. Even elected officials were not told by MSHA that natural gas was present at Upper Big Branch. You know, I, I never heard that. I always assumed that there was a, a methane. That I'm in favor of increased production. We have to plan for the future. What I want to do is work with West Virginia to figure out how we can seize that future. But to do that, that means there's going to have to be some transition. We can't operate uh, the coal industry in the United States as if we're still in the 1920s or the 1930s or the 1950s. We've got to be thinking, what does that industry look like in the next hundred years? After the Upper Big Branch accident killed 29 miners, the U.S. government added more regulations for mining which are meant to protect miners and to promote a safe work environment. But experts are concerned about how these rules are developed. We have a regulatory system developed in the 70s with dates from the 60s, 50s, and earlier. Meanwhile, the technology and our knack for managing it has drastically changed, while the regulations have not. It's pretty common for us to see regulations put in place to regulate the mining and extraction industry that are not actually based on good science or engineering principles. Blankenship believes MSHA regulations and findings are not balanced because they have no direct oversight. MSHA sort of has a, a, a dictatorship over what's going on in the mining industry. And uh, same thing is true in accident investigation. Instead of having a, you know, two independent groups in the government, one to regulate the mines and one to inspect accidents or investigate accidents, we have just the one. So effectively, OMSHA is able to investigate themselves and therefore any time they have an investigation, it's going to be uh, the company or someone else's fault and not theirs. Uh, the truth of the matter is OMSHA imposes a lot of regulation and policy on coal mines that are not well thought out and at many times uh, reduce the ventilation and damage the mine's ability to be safe as opposed to helping. Safety at Upper Big Branch was the top concern for the Massey Corporation. In fact, the company established safety guidelines that surpassed government requirements. Massey had a productivity program, productivity standards. We had a safety standards program and the safety standards program was S1, that safety is job one and productivity was job two. So it was S1 and P2. According to WSAZ Television, an independently conducted confidential survey of Massey underground miners found that 91% believe that the company's S1 or Safety First program makes Massey mines safer places to work than competitors' mines and safer than required by law. But there were people that were intimidated and afraid and it was production ahead of safety. The way it, the perception and what I took away from talking to the families that lost their loved ones, those 29 miners, the majority of them believe that it was production first, production second, production last. More so than we're gonna shut, shut this down, stop until we make it safe. 
and I heard that story over and over again. I don't have the facts and proof, but I'm sure the investigations will prove all that out. At Massey, I probably was personally responsible for dozens of safety enhancements on equipment, things as simple as reflective clothing all the way up to uh, staircases being put on large trucks instead of ladders so the men were less likely to fall off the staircase than the ladder, in addition to uh, cameras being on the equipment. I grew up in the coal mining area. I put gasoline in coal miners' cars from the time I was seven or eight years old. I played baseball in the coal field leagues with them. I knew them very well, and so did the other people at Massey. We were local, uh, we were related, uh, we understood the issues, we knew the, the challenges, so we were very passionate about it. He never lived in Richmond, Virginia, where headquarters was because he preferred to be in, in West Virginia and uh, where, the, where the company was actually mining coal so that he could be on, in on everything that was going on at every, every coal mine. Unlike most CEOs, Don Blankenship does not work out of a high rise in a big city. He operates out of a trailer in Belfry, Kentucky, just across the river from Mingo County. You can go through the S1, S1 book and you can see the, the, the standards that were set over and above the, uh, the, the, the requirements of the law. That, that's really what the S1 program was all about. It was about do, doing things that were, that were above the law, not, not, complying, just, not just complying with, with the law. And Don followed it up. Years ago, probably 20 years ago, I recommended to Ilmsha and, and others that we develop a proximity device because a lot of coal miners were being injured or killed by being hit by equipment. And the idea was to uh, put a transmitter on a belt of a coal miner that would detect the equipment near him and cause the equipment to shut down. And uh, they were very resistant and very disinterested in those types of proposals. If the government ignores these types of innovations, how can the mining industry protect miners? Some of the regulations need to be replaced or just canceled completely. It's true that industry has the responsibility, but the larger question is, will the government take their responsibility to support the industry's efforts in safety? We owe them action. We owe them accountability. We owe them an assurance that when they go to work every day, when they enter that dark mine, they are not alone. They ought to know that behind them there is a company that's doing what it takes to protect them, and a government that is looking out for their safety. But if a tragedy can be prevented, it must be prevented. That's the responsibility of mine operators, that's the responsibility of government, and that is the responsibility that we're all going to have to work together to meet in the weeks and months to come. Well, it's a hollow promise. You're not going to prevent accidents from happening unless you fully understand what caused the accident. The experts in the field of chemistry and geology and, and people with a lot of experience in mining and uh, gas production agree that this was a natural gas explosion. It's clear uh, that it was. Uh, and unless we accept that it was a natural gas explosion and, and get away from the political agenda, we're not going to make the improvements in mine safety that are necessary to keep the political promise that this will never happen again. We can sit here and blame the sins of the past or we can try to fix it. And I'd rather try to fix it because I can't, I can't go back in time and change it, but I can make sure we don't repeat it. Many experts believe if new regulations are created based on popular theories instead of sound science, mine safety will not improve. The media, Congress, and the average person find it hard to fathom that MSHA and other regulatory agencies don't have the right regulatory design. That realization has to come first. And so it is uh, necessary that the government and the industry uh, study the geology in and around UBB and other mines that are having these massive natural gas inundations and try to determine what geological characteristics lead to these types of inundations and then to try to uh, foresee their happening and then to try to formulate uh, ideas and policies that would prevent an explosion from occurring should they happen. Experts agree that rules are necessary 
but experts insist rules should never be for rules sake. There has to be a bottom line. Regulations are simply not structured to keep bad things from happening. They need to change. MSHA doesn't have a research scientific technology department. It's, it's designed to, to make laws and enforce them upon the coal industry to obey the MSHA law. And if you do that, you, you, the assumption is that you're safe. The common complaint among mines, MSHA emphasizes very small matters and doesn't focus on the big issues. Uh, it's just like the UBB explosion. There's so much that was learned and so much more that could be learned and that could be done to make a natural gas explosion less likely, but uh, the government's more focused on politics and, and on uh, maintaining their power over coal companies than they are in actually improving coal miner safety. Blankenship believes that MSHA's decision to reduce airflow at Upper Big Branch was irrational and says that MSHA has many irrational policies such as the forced idling of continuous miner scrubbers. You're cutting the coal, which creates dust, with a, uh, a machine. And when that dust is sucked in to a, uh, you know, like a vacuum cleaner, and that air passes through a filter and simply, simply comes out the other side. So uh, a good part of that dust collects on the filter. And it has two or three positive effects. One is it increases visibility, which is always important. Two is it prevents the dust from getting in the lungs and causing black lung. And three, it takes that uh, coal dust out of the return airways, which reduces the chance of an explosion. And respirable dust is what causes the lung problems uh, when, when you're mining. And why in the world they would want, they, they would force a company not to, not to run that scrubber is beyond me. MSHA continues this policy, even today. I'm not aware of that. I'm glad you've made me aware of that and I will check into it. I was not aware that they're shutting down basically the scrubbing on those. This MSHA mandate forces miners to shut off equipment that they know protects their own health and safety. After being denied the opportunity to speak with MSHA head Joe Main, Massey miner Buddy Mayer told the Mining Accident News, the scrubber is the best tool that ever came along. I've already put in 32 years but these younger guys are breathing dust all the time, and they're going to suffer black lung. Yet he ain't got a couple minutes to talk with us. There's no logic that I can find in Elmshire sure requiring mines to shut those scrubbers off. Speaking to the same publication, Massey miner Sean Turley said, you almost feel like a guinea pig. Without dust controls on these continuous miners, all the coal miners are breathing in dust the whole shift. Those scrubbers took away that problem. It just don't make sense. Some of the regulations need to be replaced or just canceled completely. They change rules about things like belt air and bleeding of the gob and uh, fire bossing and so forth unilaterally and without it being well thought out. And oftentimes it's to the detriment of coal miner safety instead of to the benefit. They uh, have come to perform more like a police force, trying to catch someone doing something wrong as opposed to bringing a, se a separate set of eyes to the mine to help find a better answer or to point out issues that need to be corrected. Many times it causes a lack of focus on true issues. While blocking some innovations such as scrubbers, MSHA is also simply not supporting others. Blankenship believes that modernized mapping of old underground mines would dramatically improve safety, but MSHA is not pursuing it. Probably a great example of uh, the government and MSHA being behind on technology is in mapping. Uh, you know, we still have very inadequate mapping in the industry. We had the incident of people cutting into gas wells, cutting into old mine works. And because we don't have these maps digitized and in a centralized database, you know, the Mine Safety and Health Administration simply hasn't been, if you will, an advocate of uh, the use of technology to improve safety. The media, the government, and the unions accuse Massey Energy of putting profits above safety. But Blankenship knows that safe mines are profitable. For one thing, I'm smart enough to know that keeping your coal miners safe and not having accidents is very profitable. So even those that think very badly of me and think that I'm solely focused on profit should understand that I also know that profit can only be derived from safe coal mines.
But way beyond that, you know, I've been uh, in the coal mining community and, and involved in coal mining all my life. And so too has all the people at Massey and the people that were working at this mine. And the idea that somebody in New York or Washington or uh, someone in the media cares more about these coal miners uh, than we do makes no sense at all. I mean, we know in many cases their families and their sons and daughters. So uh, we have passion and we have an understanding of the economics of mining and our record on what we did to uh, be creative in the area of safety speaks for itself. Even though Don Blankenship no longer works in the coal industry, why does he continue to fight for miner safety? And if you recognize that over the, over the years, that was a, a very important part of, of Don's character, is that he wanted uh, all, all, all people to be treated as human beings. Twenty-nine miners died in the explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine on April 5th, 2010. An outcry against Massey Energy blamed the company's allegedly lax safety standards for the accident. In the five years leading up to the disaster, Massey had been cited by the government for more than 1,300 safety violations. Early on, officials pointed to bad ventilation and coal dust buildup as key problems. MSHA accused Massey of cutting corners and allowing coal dust buildup to fuel the explosion, but ignored forensic evidence that proved the accident was caused by a massive natural gas inundation. And the gas that came out of this mine was clearly natural gas that came out of the strata of the earth. MSHA accused Massey of improper and insufficient rock dusting, in effect questioning the common sense of every miner. The minute he got into that black section, he'd turn around, go back, and he'd say, get that goddamn section rock dusted. I'm not gonna work in a section that is not rock dusted. MSHA failed to account for the force of the explosion when accusing Massey of faulty rock dusting. Dust gets kicked around. Chunks of coal get banged into, into equipment and pulverized. MSHA's own inspectors reported the mine to be sufficiently rock dusted in the weeks and days prior to the accident. Moreover, they neglected to report that they required the company to change its original ventilation system, decreasing its performance by 60%. And the law only requires 30,000 CFM of air. We had 120,000 when we were operating the mine the way we wanted to operate it. When we got through making the changes that the government wanted to make, we were around 50,000. In the months prior to the explosion, MSHA inspectors spent an average of seven hours, 15 minutes per day in the mine. In spite of this, they never addressed their own responsibility for the safety of the mine before or during the time of the accident. When asked to comment about their findings, MSHA refused to be interviewed for this documentary because of Don Blankenship's involvement. Don Blankenship the man directly blamed for this tragic accident believes that he has always done his best to live up to his responsibility for minor safety. He personally introduced dozens of safety enhancements that are now the standards of the industry. And this documentary is further evidence of his taking his responsibility seriously, even at great risk and expense to himself. So he always referred to the people who work for him as members of the company. And if you recognize that over the years, that was a, a very important part of, of Don's character. He wanted all people to be treated as human beings, and uh, it was, he was very sensitive to that. He was one of those members, and that's why he, he lived with and, and, and it lived in the same environment there in the, in the coal communities. The purpose of the documentary is to uh, try to get people to focus on what actually happened at UBB and to make improvements in the safety of coal miners. Don also hopes that this documentary will encourage today's mining companies, the government, the United Mine Workers of America, university engineering professors and students, consulting experts and industry associations to do the same. The United Mine Workers and the Mine Safety and Health Administration are living in the past. You know, they don't uh, 
see things for what they are because they're blinded by their dislike for business and their dislike for certain individuals and they don't look at the physics of things and the technology. That's the most important thing, that we recognize that accidents happen, they can be prevented, but they can't be prevented with propaganda and politics. They can only be prevented with uh, physics and technology. The uh, best way to honor the victims of UBB is to uh, base ongoing policy and safety procedures on the truth of what happened at UBB. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize that the victims at UBB were good people and they were doing the best they knew how. Uh, what is incumbent upon us now is to learn more and be able to use this accident uh, in honor of them to formulate better safety practices going forward. In the UBB case, uh, it's clear to me we had a natural gas explosion and that nothing that the industry is doing is going to prevent it from happening again, despite the politicians' promises to the contrary. And uh, that's what this documentary is all about, that if you're truly going to improve coal mine safety or industrial safety or even environmental stewardship, you first have to know what happened and what you can tangibly uh, do that will prevent it from happening again. If we don't do any more than we've done, UBB will happen again.